second EBBF uh, Will Met webinar. We see the people trickling in, so we just uh, welcome each and each one of you. And we'll be shortly starting in just a few seconds. See, there's a 20 so far. And the numbers are going up. And in case anybody's wondering about this first slide, this is actually Arthur Dahl's nephew, I've been told, in Yosemite. So that's a beautiful real life picture. It's not a stock photo or anything of the kind. So the Dahl family is included in this, uh, in this first slide as well, giving us hope in pursuit of hope in this time of crisis. So this is uh, the, I can introduce the uh, second in the series of these uh, EBBF uh, Will Met uh, webinars. Uh, the idea is, is really EBBF, if people are not familiar, is this uh, behind inspired global learning community. And what we do is a company. So the idea is that we are exploring together with people of all faiths, how can we apply Baha'i values in our workplaces, economic systems, how can you rethink the structures to make and create this better world that we all aspire to? So with this in mind, we are offering a series of uh, presentations and of exchanges from EBBF members. And today we have Arthur Dahl. He will be the person introducing and giving us hope and in pursuit of hope in a time of crisis. And the crisis seems to be continuous, especially acute at this moment, but I'm sure it will continue on. And uh, welcome to all the new people that have just arrived. I see 30 odd, uh, and so it's a very timely topic to be covered. And um, I think most of the people, everybody knows Arthur Dahl, just in case you don't, is this uh, humble genius that I've uh, the pleasure of interacting with. Uh, the one little known fact that one of his first offices was a hut on a deserted island with just two coconut trees in Belize, and it's just... Uh, uh, just so beautiful just to see that because that's his experience from the he was doing research at the Smith, smithsonian institute in uh, uh, studying coral reefs at the time and you will see very soon as you you see arthur where he's now he's got this flag of switzerland behind him so he's currently based in uh, switzerland geneva in fact in lockdown in switzerland geneva and uh, today he's uh, covering this wonderful topic and very timely of pursuit of hope in a time of crisis. So without further ado, Arthur, uh, look forward to hearing presentation. After a brief 15, 20 minutes, we will open for Q&A. So there's a Q&A uh, button at the bottom where you can just post your questions or in the chat, and I will then relay the, chat, the questions that you are making to Arthur. Arthur. Thank you very much, Danielle, and thank you, Monet Zudu, for hosting uh, this session. Uh, when I was looking at the... <coughs> beginning of, of a book that I published last year, which I actually wrote a year and a half ago or two years ago, the beginning of the preface says, hope has become a rare commodity in today's world. Everything seems to be going wrong, and the forces of disintegration are accelerating. We may wonder what will come first, a financial collapse, a climate catastrophe, a global pandemic, a third world war, or some equally disastrous outcome for material civilization out of control. Well, it turns out I think the pandemic came first. So it was among you know the, th the things I could see on the horizon. I'd, it wasn't possible to predict which of those would come first, but I think we're now well and truly into you know uh, something that people are saying is you know, the worst that we've been through at least since the Second World War, if not the Depression or you know, much, much of, the, of the 20th century. And uh, I don't think we've seen the end of it. Uh, clearly, we're going through a major health crisis at the moment. Uh, everybody says there's going to be an economic crisis because of the amounts that have to be spent to keep the world going when the economy is at a, more or less at a standstill. Uh, I've even seen references that one of the consequences will be a major famine because if people in the third world you know, are, are, are killed off by, by the virus, then agriculture will collapse in much of the world uh, for lack of people to work on it. So I don't think we're the end uh, of those challenges, which of course makes it more and more difficult of any kind of, of hope in the future. I think particularly for young people today, uh, you know, they were been worried about the climate catastrophe already. They've seen social fragmentation, failures of government, and so that you know, hope may have seen impossible the circumstances. So <clears throat> without being a dreamer out of touch with reality, how can we help people find a positive way forward? So you know, I asked myself, you know, as an environmental scientist and a Baha'i, 
how I managed to remain optimistic after a half century in the middle of all the environmental crises and so on, since I spoke at the first Earth Day in Washington in 1970. And of course, to answer that question really is, what is it that we're hoping for? That makes a big difference as to how we define, you know, whether we can find hope, you know, in in the life that we're living. Uh, Is it our purpose in life to materially successful, to be a dominant consumer and buy more than anybody else, to be famous, to be powerful, or perhaps to refine our characters, to contribute to an ever-advancing civilization, to be of service to others, to acquire spiritual qualities. This is much more, you might say, the Baha'i perspective on what should be our our purpose in life. And then, uh, how do we find some guidance? Where do we go? Where do we find models to follow uh, looking at this? And it's clear that life is not meant to be an easy ride. We need to struggle to grow, to develop our qualities. Just as an athlete has to make great efforts to increase, increase his performance. And therefore, looking for the life of a couch potato, you know, watching ads all day long, uh, you know, maybe some people's ideal, but that's not how we're going to develop, you know, our best human qualities. And, you know, I thought, well, to try to tell the story to others, uh, you know, if you look at computer games, in computer games, players are seeking weapons to enable themselves to defeat the enemies or the demons and other threats at stages of increasing difficulty. And so already there's a model there of increasing struggles in order to acquire certain kinds of qualities to win the game. In traditional mysticism, spiritual growth follows a metaphorical journey through perhaps seven valleys or stages of increasing awareness and selflessness, whether you look at Sufi poem, poem, thinking of many generations past or Baha'u'llah's own book, The Seven Valleys, So it seemed to me there was a sort of a storyline here for the exploration of hope that might be a way to address this issue. And therefore, I tried to say, well, let's imagine facing the problems of today through, uh, you know, and the crises that we're facing through a series of challenges, combining a scientific approach and, you might say, a more ethical or spiritual approach, a more human approach to where we might try to find hope at each stage you know, in, in this process. And uh, we, have to, we have to sort of see that, you know, we may be going to what looks like disaster. Things are collapsing all around us. At the same time, this may open up new potentials. And there's, that's part of, you know, where hope can come. So I imagined, you know, a story of going through seven valleys. And the first valley was the valley of lost souls and the quest for unifying vision and values. I imagined a valley, never much like the society we see today, people all over, but they're blind. In a sense, you might say they're, they're spiritually blind. They're, they're wandering through life, uh, but not seeing the true sense of what they're doing, what they're going through. And therefore, to try to uh, make sense of that, we say, well, one, as a system scientist, say, well, we need systems thinking. These are tools that help us to integrate many different things together. You know, the economic, you know, the environmental, the social, and so on, to try to get a, a view of the larger picture and how the system may behave over time. And so that might be one tool you need for the struggles ahead. Then we have, you know, what values do you, can you take on to provide an ethical framework for making the choices that will come along this way? Inevitably, in any, you know, struggle against various challenges, we, we, need, we need to go on you know, and of course, then from this way, we go to, you might say, the next valley. Once you've armed yourself with values and some, some scientific thinking, and that's the valley of the environmental crises. And there, we have all sorts of crises. We, with the climate change, uh, pollution, biodiversity loss, and so on. Each of these, you might say, we're, we're, you know, we're teetering on the cliffs of climate change, could fall off at any time. We're trying to wade through swamps of pollution, trying to find a way you know, through this value, we're risking overshoot and collapse. You know, if we overshoot the planetary boundaries you know, of our, our global environment, you know, we could easily see a collapse of civilization. And then many scientific studies have warned of this ever since the limits to growth in 1972. At the same time, we could try to find our way out of these challenges and up into you know, the plateau of environmental sustainability. We have scientific solutions to all these problems. We know 
what we need to do to try to protect biodiversity better. We know what the pollutants are, and if we had the will, we could phase them out and find replacements. So it's not that we don't know what to do. It's the political will that is lacking in, in doing it. <clears throat> then we can go on to, might say, the valley of social illnesses, which you might imagine as being masses of the poor swarming around you know, the rich up in their castles on, you know, on, on hills, ignoring what's going on around them, swept by epidemics and so on. You know, suffering from disunity and inequality, and yet you know you can address those social problems partly through cultivating more altruism and cooperation, and the whole Baha'i vision of, of social action, uh, which means that many things can be done already to address these problems and to at least at the level of community at a small scale, finding ways out of these social challenges and trying to build you know the foundations for for a better world. The next valley would logically be one of the economic crises, uh, and you know, where we find ourselves trapped in the growth paradigm. We have to keep growing forever, even in, in, in when we have limited resources. And we're now seeing the challenge of that today, where suddenly the growth that seemed to be essential you know, has come largely to a halt to save us you know, from the pandemic. And things that seemed to be impossible you know, a few weeks ago have suddenly happened. But it also means we can question the values behind that economic system. You know, driven by greed, you know, profit above everything else, ignoring the impact on you know poor workers and other parts of the world, and therefore you know, rethink you know, the you know, what's working right through this this valley of economic crises. What do we do to improve governance of the economy so that it works at a global level? You don't have multinationals, uh, you know, driven by profit everywhere, you know, raping the planet for their own. You know, self- suddenly many of them have had the brakes slammed on them today. And they're questioning the future, asking for bailouts from before they would have defended themselves against any government interference. We also need a new ethics to address the economic challenges, much more altruistic and cooperative. We need to find new ways of accounting beyond just GDP as a measure of progress. Uh, and there are many other tools that have been developed to say, well, how do we account for you know, social capital and for natural capital and the other things in a more better way of looking at balance in the economy? And then, of course, we have the whole plan from the United Nations, the 2030 Agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals, as a, you know, a, a way of looking in an integrated fashion at moving ahead towards sustainability in the mountains of, sustain- of transformation. But, of course, it doesn't do just to deal with the economic, social, and environmental problems outside of us. If you want to develop some sort of hope, you also have to deal with your own internal self, your own valley of individual discovery and development. And this is where we can turn to the, might say, the more spiritual side of our nature. When we learn you know, to struggle against egoism and cultivate more altruism as we become more adults, you know, the sm- small infant thinks only of himself. That's all that he knows. By the time we become parents, suddenly the children are more important than many of our own desires. This is a normal part of growth in life. We also see the struggle between pessimism and optimism. Part of it is, in fact, genetic. Some people you know, have are always more nervous and reactive to negative things and tend to be more conservative in their outlook, but it's only a quarter of, of these differences. And a lot can be done to address the negative side and to do, cultivate a more optimistic view of the future. We also need to look, as we look at our individual development, both at the rationality, the scientific side, and what you might call the belief side, the ethical side, the spiritual side, and bring them together and acknowledge that if we really want to open up as a more hopeful human being, we need to be cultivating more of that spiritual reality in us, because that is something that is not subject to any of these threats or dangers from outside, uh, that you know, can always be cultivated and developed no matter what happens to us, even if we're thrown in prison or whatever. Uh, we know that there are investments there that will always you know, be beneficial. But that is not sufficient, particularly for the young, skeptical, scientific-minded person of today, and so we also need to look at the multiple realities in the world. And you know, science already recognizes multiple realities. You can touch something in front of you, and it's solid. You can feed it. That is real. You ask a chemist, and that reality is a bunch of atoms you know, running around a nuclei uh, in various molecules, mostly in some kind of space or probability of location. And then you can you ask a physicist about reality, and he goes, oh, it's, it's a question of, of probabilities. We don't know until we measure it. 
And then you ask a mathematician for him, his reality is um, abstract mathematical formulae. They have a beauty that goes beyond anything concrete and real. And ultimately they say, well, information never created or destroyed in this universe. The only thing missing in that scientific view of reality is you might say an, an absolute reality, which can be defined in religion as God or you know, uh, Allah or Nirvana or something that we can, is beyond knowledge and understanding. Just acknowledging the, having the humility to say, yes, there may be realities beyond things that we can know. You have to admit, you know, ultimately, there's more something that's beyond us. And that's what opens us then to some sense of God. And then from that, to understand the role of the manifestations of God, the divine teachers, and helping to teach us about the reality, both in our own selves and in society, to find our way forward. And so this valley helps us to discover those, those higher dimensions of reality that are also part of what, it, what is this creation. And then you might say the last valley, the seventh valley, is really having armed yourself with these tools, your scientific understanding, your acknowledgement of you know, solutions to environmental problems, social problems, economic problems, you know, the challenges of dealing with the problems within yourself and making yourself a stronger person. Then you might say, what are visions of the future? How do you see the future you want to contribute to? What are the mountains of innumerable possibilities before us? How do you take charge of your own life, regardless of the challenges you may be facing? Hold on to a positive vision, something you can contribute to, develop even perhaps your own scenarios of how you see your future unfolding in the world, moving from crisis to some kind of, of solutions. And maybe to recognize you can even start building that reality in your own local community and things you can do yourself. And this is where the Baha'i community is focused on very much today. And in many ways, that you might say is the best insurance for whatever crises we may be facing in the years ahead. If you have strong local community solidarity, people working together, uh, you couldn't have a better you know, insurance to whatever challenges may be thrown at us. So it really is like by combining what science can give us, the tools of system science, together with a broader spiritual view of our potential, our possibilities, the things we can draw strength from, whether it be in meditation, in prayer, uh, in you know, mastering some of our animal side in order to invest more in contributing to society through service and so on. These are ways that we can find you know, hope both for ourselves and for the future that is before us, regardless of all the challenges that it may, may throw at us. So if you want to go further, you can, because we have to acknowledge that we're living in a time of rapid, often chaotic change, but this is a process that can help to sweep away the old institutions no longer adapted to this new reality of a united world, allowing a new and better system to emerge, bringing justice, sustainability. We were talking about it for a long time, it seems to be now happening. And this is really the time to you know, say, well, we're in the middle of it, we need to build our sense of hope to carry forward. We must rise to the occasion, Overcome the last resistances could change, because there will certainly be many resistances in, from the vested interests in the status quo, and start building a better world, learning as we go. We don't know all the answers, but if we already have a perspective of how to make it better, we can learn as we go along to improve it. So I hope you have many questions and proposals for making the world better and acquiring hope for yourself, your family, and the people around you. And so if you want to go further, uh, you, you, you know, the book that I published this last year, before this exploded, which still can be useful, is still very pertinent today, can be ordered from George Ronald Books or from Amazon. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion that will follow. And I just posted in the chat uh, the link to Arthur's book, and it was originally written for youth, but I think it's really a much wider audience that's now ready to enjoy it and to uh, make uh, full use of it. Before we go to the two questions so far from Keith and Roger, I just wanted to touch base on one question that came in the registration from uh, Giti Etemad. Uh, she's a grandmother because she says, why should I not be afraid about my children and my grandchildren, even though I'm a devout uh, Baha'i? You did mention in your presentation, Arthur, that we have the insurance of the Baha'i community, but maybe you can give some hope to this grandmother and obviously, he's talking about the next generation, what happens next. Well, you know, we don't choose what generation we live in. You know, we, there were those who were, you know, born at the generation that went through the First World War, the Second World War. We're clearly going to be going through some kind of crises that we don't yet fully understand 
or imagine. Uh, and I think that with, in, in that context, we have to acknowledge that life may not be easy for our children and grandchildren, but there's a lot that we can do to prepare them for what is coming, to arm them against these things, uh, to you know, acknowledge, yes, things may be more difficult, there may be times when life won't be so easy, but if we've given them some spiritual foundation, if we've given them some tools, a sense of community, we've let them experience what it is to be altruistic and to contribute to others, uh, I think that's the best thing. That was, in a sense, the purpose of the book that I wrote, thinking of people like that. I mean, what would I give to my children and grandchildren to help them find their way through the, through the times ahead? And I think that's, you know, that's the best thing we can do is to arm them for the challenges, to help them to recognize that through prayer, they'll be able to grow. We won't all necessarily survive it. That's something that's beyond our control. But at least we can give them the best start in life as possible and then help them to find their own way forward. And I'm sure they will do a wonderful job of it. Thank you very much. Keith Schlesinger has a question about uh, laws. So as Baha'is, of course, we need to respect the laws of the country. But he's pointing out that if laws divide and fail to keep humanity unified during the pandemic, he mentions a specific examples in the US, but I would broaden it <laughs> to a global uh, lack of good laws. What can Baha'i institutions, how can they respond to the needs of the time? Well, you know, we've always been advised and we're very fortunate to have such wonderful guidance from the Baha'i institutions, whether it had been Shoghi Effendi at the time of the guardianship or even Abdul Baha before at the time of, of World War I. Uh, we, you know, we obey the laws of a country because we believe in unity. And if we start picking and choosing laws to obey or disobey, we're following the same example as uh, you know, all the other present society now, which is disintegrating because there's no sense, you know, stronger sense of unity. So at the same time, while we don't deny our faith, you know, if there's a law is passed saying that we must abolish all Baha'i institutions, uh, as they did in Iran, we obey, we do it. Doesn't mean we don't stop living a Baha'i life and trying to apply our principles, uh, but we try to do it in ways that are, you know, not inconsistent with the, the laws doesn't mean that we support these bad laws, but at least we don't, you know, intentionally you know, go against them. So I think, and of course, at the same time, we can work for better laws. And at this time of so much questioning, uh, there, there are more and more opportunities to say, it's not simply what's wrong, what's bad to be thrown out, what would we put in its place? Can we propose another set of principles or laws, a new kind of administration, not led by individuals driven by their egos, uh, that is a better way of making decisions. Can we even create at a small scale pilot examples of how these laws might work as we do in the Baha'i community and show this as an example outside? Well, this is a way of doing things better. And I think this is where we can always try to find the positive side of any situation and the way that is consistent with Baha'i principles to go forward and encourage others to follow. And I like the encouragement to others as well. That, that also relieves us of all the responsibility we have to do ourselves and be aware that there's a group of people, a wider group of people that can get into action. Another question comes from Roger Neyman. Um, and by all means, if you wish to ask any questions, just write in the Q&A that you, could see, you should see in the bottom of the screen, a Q&A button. So just type your question there and be happy to relate on, over to Arthur. Roger Neyman asks, what is the relationship between a spiritually grounded embrace of science and the pursuit of hope? Is it important to address the materialistic misuse of science, of scientism, in the public discourse? Well, I think this is, you know, this is, there's always a balance. This is what we talk about, you know, the harmony you know, of science and religion. Science can give us many answers to the material side of the problems of the world, but science does not make value judgments about how we respond to you know, the scientific evidence. Uh, uh, there are those who respond in a very egotistical way and selfishly say, well, I'm going to do everything for myself. Uh, and there are others that you know, may say, well, you know, this is a time to be sharing and so on. So, and I think this is where, you know, in a sense, science may be quite depressing. The science of climate change is warning us about 
the challenges that will develop in the decades immediately ahead. It, it used to be so, several generations in the future, and then it was the next generation. Now we're in the middle of it. It's going faster and faster. Uh, and th so the more that we can live according to what that science is telling us, set an example of being more responsible, it well and good. At the same time, it's the spiritual dimension that can help us to maintain hope where the science itself may be so depressing. Because the, we know from the larger perspective you know, of the Baha'i faith that these are the trials and difficulties that will clean our material civilization of its attachment to too much of the material side of life. You know, you know, we have, science has given us all sorts of gadgets which are sold to us with very expensive advertising to keep us as passive consumers. Uh, this is not necessarily building our, our human potential. We need to pick and choose. Uh, we're told maybe by living a simpler material life that we can all then put more energy into doing those, those higher things at the social, artistic, cultural, and spiritual level that are the real fruits of, of human civilization. So I think this is where uh, you know, that balance of, of science and faith, science and religion you know, comes together. We, we follow the science. This is a science. Baha'i faith is not a science. And the, you know, the Sugi Pen and the Guardian always said, leave science to the scientists. Fortunately today, we have quite a few Baha'i scientists who both know the science very well and also can help to you know, guide us in terms of how it, it interlocks with our values. And, and many of them are working very hard to apply that science. I think particularly of somebody like, like Aldo Thorgerson, an environmental scientist, spent many years helping to lead the negotiations of the Climate Change Convention through the Paris Agreement, a uh, you know, you know, wonderful form of service. And so there are you know, this is where the, the, the two can come together. And we have another uh, question that was uh, posed before the call by Francis Hayden, also from the US. Uh, he mentions these uh, meta-narratives. Uh, so there is also, especially if we're looking for hope, we're looking for visions. You mentioned it yourself. And so the, the concept of the meta-narrative that goes beyond the immediacy, that goes beyond the local, that goes offers the bigger picture, seems to be the ideal thing that we should go towards. But there seems to be a resistance to embrace these much-needed meta-narratives. What comes to mind, Arthur? Well, I mean, you know, meta-narratives can be many things. Uh, you might say capitalism is a meta-narrative. It's a framework within which a whole set of decisions are taken that make, make, you know, provide a way of making sense of one's economic behavior or that may justify certain kinds of behavior and so on. You could probably say that many forms of nationalism are a meta-narrative. My nation is better than any other, and therefore it should have the dominant position in the world. Racism could be a meta-narrative. My race is the best race. I think meta-narratives have always existed. You know, we need to have some kind of a, a framework. Otherwise, we're left totally adrift and don't really, you know, where to go. at the same time, they can be in traps. You know, this is where you've got confirmation bias. People trapped in a meta-narrative then listen only those things to support that, that, that set of values and deny any other, reject anything else. So we see today many people trapped in such, such meta-narratives. But these are things that need to evolve, that needs to change. We're living in a world with many meta-narratives that evolved for a very different world, the world of separate nations, of, you know, the world before technology united us in one single world. And that's where the Baha'i meta-narrative of the oneness of humanity and the values that go with it is really the meta-narrative of the future. And so our challenge is to help people to grow out of outdated and, and outworn meta-narratives. And of course, Abdu'l Baha was very good at challenging people's assumptions. That's where you have to start by shaking their, the certainty of the meta-narrative. Well, your assumption is that man is only material, and therefore meeting material needs is all that needs to be done, which was a bit meta-narrative behind, behind communism. Huh. And, and when once you show the logical inconsistencies, well, this leads to something terrible, this leads to, you know, we can see where it goes if you take a logical conclusion, then people may begin to question, and then we need to offer them a new and better meta-narrative to take its place. And that's in many ways what the Baha'i faith is trying to do. Fortunately, it's a very diverse meta-narrative. It fits with many cultures, many peoples. It has room, considerable diversity. It's not forcing anybody into one single framework, but is a growing, evolving, developing, never looking positively towards the future. So we're very fortunate to have that to offer to people. And I think that is really how we can help people to grow out of the dysfunctional meta-narratives of the past. 
And when you talk about uh, meta narratives and visions, I really think that's an important point to look look forward to achieving. And then sometimes they're quite far away, they're quite distant, yeah. and they're so detached from the now that you feel, oh, I wish, but I can't, and therefore you just lose hope and you don't even start. So there's, I guess there's a balance between the, the big picture and the current action, and also with SDGs, for example. I think SDGs have a really good role of uniting us around something. Sometimes they're too distant, sometimes they're local. Is that one of the means through which hope can be achieved? Definitely. Because, yes, you know, if you have hope in a beautiful long-term vision somewhere or you're off on the horizon, but at the same time, uh, you are struggling with you know, the whole series of negative things, you, it may be very hard to keep hope in the short term. In fact, in the International Environment Forum, our Bahá'í Inspired Environmental Organization, we translated the SDGs down to the individual and local level, saying, well, yes, these are wonderful global goals. What would it mean your own community? What can you do yourself to make some small step forward in that direction? And we're so fortunate in the Baha'i community to have such wonderfully balanced guidance from the Baha'i institutions, where on the one hand they say, yes, you know, we are laying the foundation for a new world civilization, but right now you need to be working in your community, you know, form organizing children's classes so that children can grow up with some set of values that will be important to them, helping junior youth, pre-adolescents to learn the pleasures of being altruistic and serving others through their own projects, or helping people to strike some balance between the spiritual devotional side of life and their study and their growth and their service in, in the larger community. So on the one hand, we're given that larger long-term vision. On the other hand, we say, these are the priorities now that the world needs right now to make the next steps forward, set an example for the world of the change that needs to come. And I just, uh, I just posed in the chat the link to uh, the IEF organization, which has a wealth of materials and indications. So you may definitely want to actually look into that and see what is SDGs, as been mentioned in the chat, may not be familiar to everybody. Um, no, I should not explain them. Arthur, it's yours. <laughs> you want to explain what SDGs stand for, uh, the, the, the acronym, and what, what this implies? Yeah, we in, you know, in the outside world, we've been fortunate that as governments have tried to address the challenges, the problems they faced, uh, they've also had, I might say, a vision of the kind of future they would like to build. You know, you know, after the suffering of the First World War, you know, the 14 points of President Wilson, for creating this League of Nations, let's try to build some mechanism, collective security. Unfortunately, it had too many flaws in it. It didn't, wasn't effective enough. It failed. We went through the Second World War. And again, you know, the world leaders said, what do we do to prevent it from happening again? And they drafted the Charter of the United Nations. We the peoples, you know, and sets out some very beautiful goals of where the world needs to go, and even some tools, mechanisms for how it might get there. Again, with unfortunately some fatal flaws protecting it, preventing it from being effective. And so we've go gone on. We've had, you know, the, the the Charter of Human Rights. The UN has occasionally, you know, they had the Millennium Development Goals, you know, addressing poverty in the poorest countries. And then. In 2012, at the Summit on Sustainable Development in, in, in Rio, uh, there was a decision to launch a new process to develop another agenda to 2030. And this was then approved in 2015 by all the heads of state in the UN General Assembly. And uh, they, it in both included saying we need to make a fundamental transition, transformation in society, a paradigm shift for people and the planet, some very idealistic language. But it also said, let's be specific. Let's set 17 sustainable development goals to be achieved by 2030, to eliminate poverty, to eliminate hunger, to educate all children. You know, these are quite ambitious and idealistic, but the same thing, these are the indicators that we can use, the targets to achieve, to show that we've met these goals so we can measure our progress as we go along. So from 2015, the countries of the world, or at least most of them have been working to build these into their national policies and practices, to apply them in, in, in their activities, to measure their progress. They report regularly to the UN you know, on the progress they're making. So 
you know, we're, we're not doing very well, we're falling behind. There's some question now, will the pandemic slow things down or may it actually remove some mode blocks and allow us to move forward on some of the goals we still have to see in the years ahead. So there always have been you know, these visions you know, from the outside. And then we're fortunate in the Baha'i community, in the Baha'i writings, we have our own vision, the future world. The, you know, the world order of Baha'u'llah that will come when the spiritual principles are applied alongside these practical measures. The two are needed in complement. And in the short term, we can be applying sustainable development goals to try to do things that seem to be ethically very important to leave no one behind, as the Yuan called for, that no human being should be left aside. Everybody should benefit from development, not just a few rich at the top, as has been happening at the present time. So, you know, this, there's this lovely balance between what the UN has set out to do, what government's trying to do through the same development goals, and what the Baha'is are trying to do in their own small way to identify the steps further beyond the, 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 and, you know, and more, the more spiritual dimension that needs to complement the material side. We really want to make progress. Wonderful. And by the way, Giti Edavat, you asked about the, this PowerPoint presentation. It is saved and will be shared. And uh, the Will Med Institute has an amazing team that posts uh, the edited YouTube in just like 24 hours or something. So it will be online very soon. We'll inform you of that. And Sarah Lehoff, uh, yesterday she offered another BBF member who yesterday offered an amazing uh, webinar on consultation. She's asking now, what signs of progress are you seeing in these seven elements, these seven values that you described of your vision of hope? How do you see any progress in any specific valley going forward faster than any other? Well, yes. Um, it's something we haven't always struck the balance because you know there have been lots of constructive things going on. We may see disintegration in major institutions of the world outside of us, but there are many hopeful things you know, people are experimenting. People are trying to do things. You know, in in the environmental area, uh, the, the a lot of work and scientifically been done. What do we need to do to address climate change? And we've had the intergovernmental panel on climate change that is set out in come detail with government approval. You know, what needs what needs to be done? Where the limits are? How we need to stay within those? And many people are saying, well, these are the technologies. This is the new energy technologies. You know. There's been lots of work done you know, showing that we could, within, within 10 or 15 years, completely replace fossil fuels without any real loss in the advantages of our civilization. The problem is the vested interests defending the old ways of doing things that have been holding us back. And that's where, you know, while we've seen some progress, I, mean, I think last year there was more investment in renewable energy sources than in fossil fuels, but at the same time, the oil companies were all planning the next 10 years to greatly increase their investment in new wells to be able to sell more and more oil and more and more plastic and so on. You had this complete disjunct between the good things happening and the bad things happening in the environmental area. Suddenly, the brakes have been slammed on the oil industry. You know, it's begging for financial help to you know, save, save it from, from collapse so they can go on making profits for the few investors at the top of them, the banks that have been supporting them. Uh, but you know, there's a real chance now to turn the corner. So the, you know, these are things that can be seen as hopeful. You know, on the social side, yes, we've had in great increasing inequality in much of the world, even though in China with its you know, did, did reduce extreme poverty, when you still have half the world population struggling to make ends meet and hardly able to meet their basic needs, something is seriously wrong, wrong in the world. At the same time, you have more and more you know, people acknowledging this and looking for alternative ways of you know, ad addressing prejudice or reducing it, you know, whether it be in the Baha'i community and many other society organizations working for, for social benefits. Uh, on the economic side, yes, the, you know, the economy you know, is, is teetering, but you have B corporations and many other you know, groups that have sort of said, well, how do we design a new way of doing business that is not just to make profits for the shareholders, but is actually be of service to society? And these, you know, are becoming more and more successful. They're out competing many of the, you know, you know the more backward new forms of business. So, you know, we have the two processes going on simultaneously. And, you know, it may well be that the crisis we're going through now and the years ahead will help us to make the breakthroughs that we need to advance much more quickly on the positive constructive side of things. And uh, Nabil asks uh, hopefulness. 
that hopefulness. Are we talking about a gift? You know, you're born with it, the typical uh, glass half full, or is it something that we can work on? Can we acquire? Can we develop? Or can we lose it as well? So how, how does hopefulness uh, shift in people? Well, you know, as I mentioned, there's been some research on the, you might say the genetic foundations of, of you know, people's reactions to positive or negative things. And you know, there's an evidence that some, some you know, part of the genome uh, may make people more sensitive and, but, <clears throat> to particular to negative things. Uh, but also it depends partly on upbringing. Children that have been through very stressful events in their childhood may for the rest of their life respond more stressfully to certain kinds of challenges and see things more negatively. But this is not something that is you know, locked in your genome. This is, you know, it may be at the most one quarter, which means that you still have three quarters within your own you know, volition, your own ability to control, to master. You know, you know, if you feel you know, a feeling of, of hate, you can consciously replace it with a stronger feeling of love. You know, if, if you feel something negative, you can say, what do I do to give a, put something you know, stronger in its place? And I think this is where uh, the, the, the spiritual side of life can give us the extra strength to make the effort to make these changes. Nobody is stuck in a particular you know, way in which they have to live. And we're, we're told, yes, we may need to struggle some more than others. Each of us has our strengths and our weaknesses. We all need to address those weaknesses and try to build on our strengths. But we're never tested beyond our ability, and therefore we, you know, with you know, drawing on those those things, whether it be better understanding our problems on a material side, or learning to be detached from things that, you know, or even saying, well, you know, I'm too sensitive to that. I don't have a television because I don't like being manipulated by advertising. I, I'm I feel I'm sensitive to it, and so I voluntarily said, I'm still not going to complicate my life with that kind of a struggle. So many, many ways we can change our lifestyle to remove some of the things you know, that seem threatening. At the same time, we can, as we develop you know, our spiritual side, acquire more and more strength to face new tests and overgrow them. And all of that gives hope. And each time you succeed in overcoming some kind of a challenge, that's, that gives you the hope you can do more in the future. At the same time, if you stop making the effort, you can begin to slide backwards and fall behind, and some people do, and sort of drift off into, you know, into a you know negative you know, and stop stop reacting. So it, it, it's really and that's where we have our, our free will to choose to go forward to make the effort or not to do so. So we're hearing some uh, very practical suggestions. Paul Mantle uh, uh, has this idea about uh, the role of youth. And he specifically says the, the planetary recovery corpse, uh, so that people in every continent, based on all past models of uh, peace corps and the mm. civilian conservation corps in the US, um, who have a specific mandate, in this case he mentions planting a trillion, trillion sounds like a lot of them, but anyway, yeah. uh, lots of trees and responding to environmental disasters. So this, I guess, is, is, is a wider con uh, question about what can youth do? Should it unite into movements? What is the role that could be explored there? Well, I think, you know, young people like love to work together. And you know, it, youth is a time of life when you don't necessarily have, you know, family attachments and so on, and are freer to, to go and do things. And that's why, you know, these, these, these organizations drawing on the energy of youth, you know, and it opens them to many possibilities. It helps them often to set their, their future career. They try things, they love doing that. I, this is where I want to spend my life. Whether you want to spend your life planting a trillion trees. I mean, there have been some Baha'is, uh, I think uh, um, Richard St. Barb Baker back in the 1920s and 30s was already you know, out planting trees whenever he could and you know, help to save, you know, block the Sahara from advancing and to save the redwoods in California. He planted lots of trees in his lifetime. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, of course, planting trees is not the only solution. And that's why people may feel good planting a tree. But if you plant the tree and don't take care of it, if you're not there to water it you know, in, a, in time of drought and so on, very few of those trees may survive. It's much better to invest in something that you can follow through on and not just feel good. I planted my trees and now I can go back to being a consumer and uh, buying the next fancy you know, smartphone or whatever, the latest kind of tennis shoes and so on. Uh, and, and I think this is where we, we really need to say, are these things that are part of sustainable solutions 
if you can help people in local villages plant trees around their village and teach them how to take care of them so they will grow into a forest and maintain the water supply of the village, provide a necessary fuel supply if they have no other you know, fuel from the wood produced in the forest and so on, return the biodiversity, improve the local climate. Uh, this, this is a much more sustainable way of taking it forward. So these, these things can be developed with a great deal of care to make certain that they are actually contributing in a sustainable way to the changes that are needed while giving young people you know, the, the experience of growing in that way, of acknowledging that they, yes, they, make it, they work hard planting the trees. Uh, at the same time, they develop bonds with other people doing the same thing. They may learn about the country they were planting the trees in and therefore feel attached to serving in other ways in the future. All of these can be constructive you know, ways forward, and we, we need many more of them to make certain, particularly at a time when we have enormous youth unemployment. One of the tragedies today in our economic system is that it's always favored you know, productivity for capital over creating employment for everybody. And so if some of these ideas you know, are at least filling that gap, helping young people to acquire some experience and to make some use of their life while uh, other opportunities may open up for them in the future, you know, all of this is a constructive way forward. But it, we need much more of that to address the sustainability problems of the world and the social problems of the world. And I just posted in the chats that we have our own EBBF member, a 16-year-old member, Ava Darling. Uh, tomorrow she's going to offer uh, uh, some ideas, another webinar about this uh, concept of not so much what is the role of youth, but rather what, how can we build bridges, no? Because sometimes I think uh, if I had to think of a millennial, I would think of Arthur, regardless of the age, because he was just sharing with me uh, prior to this call. Yes, uh, yes, I was working on three computers at the same time. So, you know, this is the typical millennial uh, attitude of multitasking. So it's not quite an age-related thing. Still, there is an association with millennials. And then what is interesting is also how can we bridge uh, the role of millennials with the roles of other, other generations? So that's something we should really think about as well. Um, and also for, um, there was a question or a point by Keith about how can, you know, he was thinking about uh, redefining and laws. And of course, you have another book, one of the many books that you wrote, Arthur, about rethinking governance. And I just posted the link there so that people can also join those 10,000 conversations to rethink uh, the United Nations. So I'm not sure about you guys, but I think uh, the, the levels of hope uh, keep rising in a very practical and wide and also high-inspired way. So thank you for that. But there's another question that came from Hussein Stuck, Stuck from Germany. And he says, how can you distinguish between an attitude of hope and false positivism? So sometimes you say, oh, you're just an optimist. You do not see the reality <laughs> of what's around you. So how can you avoid uh, that situation? Thank you, Hussein. It's an excellent question. And of course, you might say that you know, false positivism is, is really, it denies reality. It's out of touch with reality. It's sort of imaginary, a screen that one sets up of the beautiful world one wants to live in. Uh, and it's really an, an escape from reality. Hope sees the positive future, uh, but it, can, it acknowledges that it may come through trials and troubles. You know, hope is not something that says we're not going to have a perfect you know, time tomorrow. Acknowledging, as I mentioned before, the spiritual qualities that can come you know, from suffering, the constructive ways uh, that we can move forward, even the darkest of times. You know, when you look at you know, what earlier generations you know, went through, I happen to be not a millennial. I'm a pre, I'm a pre, 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 I'm not even a baby boomer. You know, I was born precisely nine months after the beginning of World War I in America, nine months after Pearl Harbor, when my mother said she had a strong desire to create life for all the lives that were going to be lost. So I'm really a, a World War II baby <laughs> from that point of view. Uh, but you know, the, the, still, does, the, the age is not something we need to be clinging to a particular generation. We go on. But, so we really need to say, you know, our hope is you know, something that, that, because we have guidance from the Baha'i writings as to the directions to take, we know as long as we're pursuing th those, those instructions, as long as we're, we're applying this, what's needed at a particular time, those are the, the building blocks towards a more hopeful future. And it's a, it's, therefore, it's a hope founded in realism, founded in science, acknowledging the problems, not denying them, but saying, yes, there's a solution to all of these. You know, even in the darkest of times, you know, there will be, a, there'll be some, some glimmers of hope 
and you can see you can see you know the the trials that the people went through World War One and World War Two. They may have very little hope in the middle of it, and yet ultimately they came out, and then you know they were able to learn from the lessons and build from them and try to do better. And again, we're facing the same challenge today. I'm saying, how do we go through the trials of our present time, which may well get much worse before they get better, and how do we, you know, in spite of that, be setting a positive example, encouraging people. You know, I sort of find you know, at my age, you know, I'm not quite 80, but I'm go- I'm certainly going that in that direction. How can I continue to encourage young people to be hopeful in spite of the challenges they're facing? You know, people like like Ava, you know who are such fantastic young people. And that, of course, gives me hope in the future. Like they have the skills, they have the knowledge, they have a global perspective that our generations didn't have or had to work very hard to acquire. You know, all the young people marching on the Fridays for the future, you know, uh, you know protesting, you know, the, the climate inaction. I went out marching with them with a sign, you know, old people support the youth, you know, to encouraging them, you know, in, in their energy, you know, in, the, in their vision of the future. And we need... We make sure that that hope is not snuffed out. I think, you know, we need to say in young people, that hope is perhaps a precious commodity. What can we do to encourage it, to stimulate it, to let it grow and develop and flower uh, and to help the next generation you know, going forward? There's, there was a comment that was made in the chat about your Swiss flag behind you. So if I know that <laughs> of any global citizen, that's definitely you. And you mentioned you cannot find the global, the UN uh, flag. So that's why yeah. you... So Arthur is just staying in, uh, is actually living in Geneva at the moment. So, uh, he's stuck, in fact, in Geneva, which is unlikely because he's usually very much a global citizen in the wider sense. But this brings me another point about um, does it, you know, the local and the global. Uh, we're talking about flags, countries, cities, uh, commun- neighborhoods, uh, what's happening around my neighborhood at 8 o'clock, everybody goes out, applauds, there's uh, all sorts of things happening. Uh, recently, they were just playing tennis between two terraces just to exchange something with each other in the lockdown. It's going crazy. But to me, it's quite interesting to understand this. What creates more hope? Is it thinking of the local, thinking of the global, acting local? global? Do you have any thoughts about these flags of not necessarily nations but that we should that might or might not give us hope well i think there's so many positive encouraging things that are happening in the world and we need to draw hope from all of them you know when we, we see you know, in spite of of the lockdown in spite of the confinement you know people are, are developing other ways to maintain a sense of, of neighborhood you know of sharing and so on you know these are this this is very encouraging the, these are the positive things that can that can blossom when old barriers you know, go away, we, you know we're told that uh, you know, a, a legitimate patriotism. There's nothing wrong with that, as long as it is subordinated to an acknowledgement that we're all part of a single human family. You know, some people are great artists, and we can admire their art. You know, some people, you know, are talented athletes. We can admire what they're doing. Some nations maybe you know set a good example in one way and not in others, and therefore we could say, what can we learn from each other as part of this wonderful diversity? You know, living in Switzerland, I think, well, you know, among you know, countries, at least this is one that doesn't have such extreme partisan politics. There's much more politics you know, by consensus. Uh, we vote several times a year. It's a national sport because the, the people can, you know, if they don't like something, they can tell the government that they don't like what they're doing and they can change it. Uh, so you know, each country has its strengths and its weaknesses, and we should share these as part of the positive things that, that we can share. At, at the same time, you know, an exclusive, say whether it be you know my country right or wrong, you know my you know mine is the greatest in the world. You know, the, these kind of exclusive approaches to these differences you know, are very damaging, and that's where we need to subordinate those to something you know to reckon our common unity, which is the scale of which we have to organize in in the world today. <laughs> And as you're probably aware, we are live stream. Well, we met is doing amazing things live streaming all over the places. And he also mentions uh, there's a mention there's a comment made by Sue Emil on Facebook. Uh, Hope is not an empty promise. It's active engagement in pursuit of a positive life that is fair and just for all. Which I thought was a nice uh, comment to add there. Grazia uh, Johansson has a question. Uh, it seems we are not very good at learning from our experience. She mentions the Spanish flu, World War I, the Great Depression. It seems that we're not <laughs> learning much about how to avoid these cycles of crisis. Um, 
how do we know we're not going to follow the same part <clears throat> uh, pattern the next time? Do we never learn? Well, I think, you know, in many ways, you know, we go through cycles. There have been some studies of this. Uh, you know, the, the lessons of, you know, of, of these earlier crises were very real. People went through them. But as the last survivors died off and they became part of history books, they lost a lot of their emotional impact that might have motivated change. And so we often sort of find we go through a generation has learned a lesson, and the next generation, you know, maybe even rejects that and goes in the other direction. And then, you know, then when the for old generation has died off, the next generation may make the same mistakes again because they've forgotten about the earlier generation. And so there, you know, there there is you know there, there is part of this this pattern. I think where we really have an advantage today is that there's another cycle, which is you might say the cycle of religious dispensations. This is not a you know, 20 or 30 year cycle, a generational cycle. You know, it's a more a thousand year cycle. And it allows us to begin to put together the small you know, bounces in the cycling into a larger picture of you know, a decline and fall of old ways of doing things and the rise of new ways of doing things and building an, an ever advancing civilization over many generations until ultimately it will begin to run to the end of the creative potential of the spiritual values behind it and will go into decline. And then we will need another process of renewal regeneration. This is the Baha'i concept of progressive revelation. And so we, we, you know, we think, well, we have principles to help us you know, for the coming thousand years uh, or a little less than that now, but then we will need new principles to take us on further and then we can go through other cycles. So I think that is a, a, a protection against the uh, you know, being trapped within the generational cycling, forgetting the lessons of the immediate, you know, you know, just one generation past. And, and hopefully, as we turn towards this, you know, in implementing this larger view, we'll be able to take steps towards a more constructive, positive future. And Vahid is manning our social media, and I think he's got, he has a comment to also uh, share from there. Bahid. Yeah, uh, one of the um, very uh, the things that really strike me among uh, what um, Arthur has been sharing is this idea that uh, crisis can be an opportunity for change, and that uh, what was disadaptive disadaptive behavior at a given moment uh, might be shed off or might be left behind because the crisis offers this opportunity for change. So th that was very interesting. And it connects to something that um, another scholar, uh, Ruha, <clears throat> Ruha Benjamin, was saying that she was discussing the topic of racism and that this uh, crisis is a portal. She was using the word portal. Uh, the, this crisis is this opportunity, this portal to leave racism behind because we are learning that some behaviors are not needed anymore or we can be just shut off, left in our past. And um, in, in my mind, this applies also for, to the process of education. Some of the um, behaviors of the past can be left behind as we adapt to new conditions and new realities. So uh, um, the question that comes from that, though, is how can we individually foster conversations that will, um, let's say, move the, the, the needle in the right direction this, uh, using this crisis as a portal for change? So what, uh, what are Arthur's tips on conversations that help move forward and uh, our evolution as a global society? Well, I think this is, in a sense, this is what the Baha'is are trying to do every day. And, you know, my, it's the, it's what my book, book has tried to do by acknowledging the problems and saying, in fact, these are ways of looking at it in a positive sense. You know, this is, there are solutions to these and there are ways we can each contribute to implementing you know, those solutions. And so I think, you know, it really, in all of our conversations, that's the best thing that we can be doing in, in the world of today, giving people hope. You know, they're really desperate for hope. And, you know, but as, as, you know, as we pointed out earlier, it's not some kind of, you know, I, I, you know, you know, false positivism. It's from saying, yes, you know, this is going to be a difficult time, but look at what we're learning from it. Look at how we're, we're rebuilding a sense of community. Look at how we're sharing with each other. We're talking to each other. We're 
being sensitive to the needs of each other, taking care of those who are more vulnerable. But these wonderful things that are that are blossoming out of these difficult times. And by emphasizing the positive, by always trying to turn the conversation towards something positive, offering some some next step forward, whether it be in some practical thing that we can do or some spiritual value that may help us to say, well, look at how we're learning a new sense of humility, that uh, you know, no one group is protected from the virus. It doesn't matter how rich you are, you know, how famous you are, uh, you know, how much power you have, or how humble you are. We're all the same before this little invisible tiny thing that is you know, out there, you know, teaching us some very fundamental spiritual lessons. And so I think you know, it, every, every conversation can go in that positive direction and help people to rise out of the, their, their misery, their concern, and their worries and see something positive and then perhaps even invite them to come and say a prayer together. Prayer is a wonderful way to be encouraging and to see things in a more positive way. Or in some other way, you know, take them, take them forward to, to explore a little bit further. All of that is creating, increasing a, a new wave of hope in the world that will come out of the trials that we're facing in the present time. And what a beautiful way to end. There's still a few questions, but unfortunately we are finished the one hour slot. So we just whet the appetite for what comes next. Uh, thank you very much, Arthur. And ending with this note of the prayer, connecting us with others, with a purpose and really giving us hope. I think that's a beautiful way to end and to give us all a great inspiration. Uh, we shared a few links of the next webinars if you're interested, but heartfelt thanks to each one of you who took the time to attend and to Arthur for always being my, my and our inspiration. Thank you very much. Well, thank Goodbye. you all for joining and keep up your work in building more hope in the world. <laughs>